In our last study on the Word of God, we dealt with the three frogs of Revelation chapter 16. What a subject to deal with. I'd like to just say this about that, if I may, right here. Have you ever had to tell someone they had bad breath? It's so difficult, isn't it? Unless, of course, it's your husband or your wife or your kids. Sometimes they have no trouble in telling mom and dad. But what I'm saying is that there are some things in life that are very, very difficult to share, even with those you love. This morning I was thinking of a statement, and I was sharing it with Brother Eldon in the back room before we came in. A little statement from the beautiful book on the life of Christ called The Desire of Ages says that Jesus was too much their friend to remain silent while they were pursuing a course that would ruin their souls. You know, sometimes it's very difficult for preachers, too, to stand in front of a, a beautiful group of people and to share about frogs or anything that's sort of grotesque. Things that sometime are rather difficult to share because it might, it might cut across our grain sometime. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's hard because all of us like to be liked. All of us like to be loved and appreciated and accepted. But as I look at the Word of God, I discover that in the Old Testament, many prophets, many spokesmen for God were never appreciated for the message they bore. Many of them were Stoned, cut asunder, buried, put in holes, left for dead. Why do we treat people that way who have our best interest at heart? I can't understand it, but it's still true in the 90s. We don't often like to hear the fact that we have bad breath. We don't like to be embarrassed. And today I don't want to embarrass any of us, but I do want all of us to be in God's coming kingdom. And that's why I'm going to share some things today that I pray we'll listen to and we'll spend some time thinking through and praying about because it's very, very important. And I wouldn't take your time or spend the hours that I have in preparation for this message if I didn't really care about you being with me in God's soon coming paradise. Today's presentation is part two of the study we began a couple of weeks ago, which I've entitled, as I've already said, Understanding Tongues. It's my personal belief that unless we understand this revelation and the significance of the little frogs and the evil spirits they represent, we will soon join them and lose out on eternal life. Because of the significance of this study and the need for true spiritual and biblical discernment this morning, as well as conviction to follow what we find in God's Word, I'd like to invite you to pray with me again right now. Father in heaven, just a moment, before we open your Word and before we study, I'd like to invite your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Lead us into truth. And even if it's hard sometimes to accept, help us to put your truth above even our feeling or our own personal desires that we might be willing to walk in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll recall that the three powers of Revelation 16, 13 unite together under three unclean spirits like frogs. Elder Garvin read that to us already this morning. Now, even though we've already identified these three powers in our previous presentation, let me just say for those of you who are here with us today for the first time, or were not here when we first studied this particular part one, let me just say in passing this morning that the frog-like spirits come out of the mouth of the dragon, which we find in Revelation 12 to be Satan. They also come out of the mouth of the beast, which we found in our last study to be the great church of Rome. And they also come out of the mouth of the false prophet, which we discovered to be apostate Protestantism. And we also pointed out 
that these three powers are to unite together in one grand movement. And according to Revelation, their goal is to ultimately gather, that was a key word, you'll recall in our last, last study, their ultimate goal was to gather the whole world into their web of deception and unity. Now there's one major point, a major point, that I would like to make right here at the beginning of today's study, and it's going to take a few moments to develop, but please follow along with me. It's a very important point. I'd like for you to take your Bibles with If you have your Bible with you this morning, I'd invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 16. I want us to take a look this morning, Revelation 16, and look at verses 12 and 13 together. This is a very important point that we need to understand if we're going to see the significance of the hour in which we live. Do you have it there? Revelation 16, verses 12 and 13. I'd like for you to read it aloud with me together. And I want you to notice specifically the first four words. Let's read. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Stop. I have a question. Under which angel do we find the three unclean spirits going forth to unite the world? Good for you. It's under the sixth angel. Now you may wonder, why is that significant? Let me show you why. Let's go back to verse 1, verses 1 and 2, and take a look. At those verses, Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Stop. Have another question. When the first angel begins to pour out the wrath of God upon the earth, what do we know about the close of human probation? That it's closed. That it's over. The judgments of God are now descending upon the earth. Man's opportunities are past. It's over. God's judgments can now begin unmixed with mercy. And only those who have gained the victory over the beast, his image, his mark, his number, and his name will be saved through this experience of the seven last plagues. Now the plagues unfold one at a time. As we come to number six, where the three powers, spiritualism, Catholicism, and apostate Protestantism go forth to the kings of the earth to gather them together for the final battle of God Almighty. What do we see? This is what we need to remember. Probation has closed five plagues before the three frogs do the last gathering of the world. Did you catch that? Probation closed five plagues before the three frogs gather the whole world. I want you to think that through with me. Noah, you remember Noah and the flood? Noah had a very similar experience. He and his family were sealed, I'm suggesting, inside God's ark for seven days while the world outside mocked and carried on their frivolous life even though they were marked for death. Probation had closed seven days before the flood came. Now the thing that concerns me as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and I know we have some here this morning that are not Seventh-day Adventists, please, you just relax. Let me talk down home this morning, okay? Okay. The thing that concerns me as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is that many of us 
seem to be waiting for a special sign, such as a Sunday law. I'd like to suggest this morning that there's another sign, and it comes just before a potential Sunday law and the close of probation. A sign that very well could be our last opportunity to get ready for the Sunday law. You see, beloved, the Sunday law is the final test. It is not the final sign that you and I should be watching for. Why do I say that? Because when the day comes for the final test or exam to be given, it's too late to study for the course. Makes sense, doesn't it? In other words, beloved, when the test comes and it's handed out, we either pass or... You've been in school, obviously. I've had some of those bad experiences, too. The Sunday law test, may I suggest, is given only to reveal character. It does not develop it. It takes time to develop character. And when the final test is given, we don't have time to develop it. We just have time to take the test. Now, with that thought in mind, let me ask you a question. If the three powers of Revelation 16, 13 are laying the groundwork right now in the 1990s for what will take place under the sixth plague, shouldn't we be doing our homework or at least studying for our final exam? If these three powers are already uniting together to carry out what they're going to do under the sixth plague, shouldn't we at least be doing a little homework? Yes. Just like the people before the flood were given a major sign before the close of their probation, I'm suggesting this morning that God has given us a major sign so that we might be prepared for the close of our probation. And I would have to say, God's good. At the appointed time, animals began to gather together. They came from the forests and the fields. Two by two and in groups of seven, they made their way into the ark. From the riverbanks and from the lake edge, they came. Birds, large and small, filled the sky. Two by two and by sevens, they flew. The evidence was overwhelming that something great was about to happen. The door of mercy was about to close on a rebellious people. That's what was about to happen. And when it closed, it closed forever. So it is today. I'm suggesting that a great religious revival of unclean spirits like frogs has begun to move upon the world. We were told about this unification of powers. Listen to the warning again. I'm reading from testimonies to this church, special writings that were given to us as a people, volume 5, page 451. When, and notice all the whens. See if you can count the whens. And then there's only one then. When, 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 then. All right, are you with me? When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, it's already begun. When she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, it's already begun. When, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle. Note again, it doesn't say to do away with the Constitution. Never did say that. It says when this nation repudiates the principles of our Constitution as a protestant and republican government, it's already begun. And when she shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, that too has already begun. Then... When these things happen, then we may know. Did you catch that? Not guess. Not say, well, it's highly probable that. Uh -uh. We may know beyond any shadow of doubt 
that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Now, beloved, if these things have already begun, then what would we expect? Could we not expect to see the marvelous working of Satan in marvelous power? Could we not expect that? I think so. The evidence that we shared from our first study, would strongly indicate that these things that we've just listed are not just starting, but are moving forward toward their final fulfillment in the unification of spiritualism, Catholicism, and Protestantism. And the point that I wanted you to see this morning is that once this unification has sufficient strength and power, the dragon will speak and a decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God will take place in this United States and as a result, America will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. And national apostasy will bring about a national ruin. When this happens, beloved, it's too late for Adventists to cram for the exam. It's too late. If our character is not developed, when the test day comes, we'll simply drop out and join with the opposition. What I'm trying to share with you in this two-part series is that when these three powers come together, we know that the marvelous working of Satan has begun and that the end is near and that our probation is about to close forever. Let me say it as clearly as I know how. In light of what I've already shared and what I'm about to share, it is my personal conviction that the final exam for Seventh-day Adventist is being drawn up in this decade. The roots of this threefold unification have been moving toward one another for generations, beloved. It didn't start this decade. This threefold unification has been stretching across cultural lines and continents for many generations, longing for the day when they could touch and embrace each other in the bonds of inseparable unity. Today, in the last decade of this century, their root systems are finally joining together And there seems to be a growing commonness of spirit among them. Michael Harper, Episcopalian editor of Renewal magazine and member of the Church of England Evangelical Council, wrote a book with a rather strange title. It's just three words called The Three Sisters. I'd like you to notice how Harper identifies these three sisters. Young ladies, Evangeline represents the Evangelicals. Charisma represents the Pentecostals. And Roma represents the Roman Catholic Charismatics. Unknowingly and certainly without intent on his part, Harper identified the three powers of Revelation 16.13. Did you catch that? The thrust of his book is expressed in his own words on page 11, and I quote, I must confess to a deep longing, he says, to see these sisters reconciled to each other, to see them openly united in Christ and the Spirit, learning from each other and humbly listening to each other. Perhaps we should ask ourselves two basic questions this morning. When Revelation 16.13 speaks of unclean spirits coming out of the mouths of Protestants, Catholics, and Satanic sources, should we not test these experiences and find out how they differ from the experiences of true Christians who are spirit-filled? Number one. And then should we not test these unclean spirits against the teachings of God's holy word? Two important questions. We want to test the experience 
of those who have the true and test the experience of those who have the false. And we want to test also this experience by it is written, the Word of God. Is that fair? I want to say it again. Two questions. We want to find the difference between the tongues of the unclean frogs and the new tongues that Jesus said his disciples would speak with in Mark 16, verse 17. So there's a true tongue and there's a false tongue. And we also want to discover if the experience of the true biblical Christian differs from the experience of the one who's being led by a false spirit. Is their experience different? Now, with the background that we've already laid down concerning the three frog-like spirits of Revelation, let's take a look at what type of tongue we could expect from the unclean spirits of Revelation. What kind of tongue could we expect from the frogs of Revelation? And then let's see how they differ from the biblical type. What I'm about to share, again, I say, is not intended to be said unkindly or in a condemning way. I share it because it's imperative, beloved, that we understand the unclean spirits of these frogs and see how they're working today to ensnare thousands of well-meaning and dedicated people around the world. I share this with you because I love you. And someday I'm going to have to stand before the Creator, God Himself, and He's going to say to me, you knew and didn't share. I'd rather answer to you than to Him. I share this as kindly as I know how, but listen. Among the Palang peoples of Burma, a person possessed by Palay-speaking magician is impelled to talk in the magician's tongue, although at ordinary times he's unable to speak it. These are simple quotes, which I'll define in a moment. In Ethiopia, in the Zer cult, the shamans talk to the Zers, or spirits, in a secret language. L. Carlisle May has shown that glossolalia is practiced in many non-Christian religions throughout the world. Now we're looking at, again, please let's focus on what, where we're headed. We're looking now at the unclean spirits of Revelation 16.13 who are like frogs. L. Carlisle May identifies some of the non Christian religions throughout the world. He says he has found them in China, Japan, Korea, Arabia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Siberia, Burma, and even in the Arctic regions. Non-Christian, tongue-speaking people. We also know that glossolalia is extensively practiced in the African tribal religions of today. And that it is experienced by atheists and agnostics alike. Now, beloved, they don't support God. And yet they speak in an unclean spirit. From the Spiritualist Manual, page 37, we're told that, quote, the phenomena of spiritualism consist of prophecy, clairvoyance, clairaudience, gift of tongues, laying on of hands, healings, visions, Trance, airports, levitation, raps, automatic and independent writing and painting, etc., etc. That's spiritualism. Now, I don't want to overmake my point this morning. But, beloved, I want us to see the seriousness of what we're talking about here this morning. I know personally that there are many wonderful people all around us that speak in tongues. And when confronted with the evidence of which I have just shared, I find them strangely tempted to justify their experience by saying, mine is different. I speak in the language of angels or under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But I have a question. I have a very serious question. And we need to prayerfully ask ourselves, does the Holy Spirit manifest himself in pagan practices and rituals 
Does he work through the crafts of witch doctors, shamans and priests of pagan religions in the same way he works in Christianity? I answer, no. An emphatic no. God's Spirit does not work in harmony with Satan or his angels. Would you agree with that? And yet, follow me now. It is well known today that priests of non-Christian religions, witch doctors, shamans, and other religious persons speak on various ceremonial and religious occasions in glossolalia or glossolalic utterances using characteristics identical with Christian glossolalia. Do you remember last time we met and I shared with you the special meeting of the pontiff of Rome when he met with world leaders and when he prayed at the great prayer conference for peace with witch doctors? you remember that? And snake worshippers? And then concluded that we are praying to the same God? Do you remember that? I want you to listen again to what I've just read. That witch doctors, shamans, and religious persons speak at religious occasions in glossolalic utterances using identical characteristics with Christian glossolalia. And I'm saying again, can two walk together except they be agreed? I'd like for you to notice Professor William J. Shameron of the Linguistics Department of the University of Toronto. As he concluded, after more than a decade of careful research on glossolalia from a linguistic perception, listen to what he said. He stated that glossolalia is a pseudo-language. It is not derived from or related to known languages. It is a meaningless but phonetically structured human utterance believed by the speaker to be a real language, but bearing no systematic resemblance to any natural language, living or dead. In other words, past. Now, in light of far more evidence than we could share in this hour, or I care to share, let me conclude by quoting from Dr. G. F. Hazel's book, Speaking in Tongue, pages 30 and 31. Modern glossolalia whether Christian or non-Christian, whether Western or non-Western, whether religious or non-religious, is not any known language, as has been commonly assumed or claimed. Glossolalia is a form of linguistic expression that is cross-culturally the same as a linguistic point of view, from a linguistic point of view, excuse me, both in Western and non-Western religions, both in Christian and non-Christian religions, both in religious and non-religious settings. He's saying again that the speaking is the same, whether you're Christian or non-Christian. And no matter what culture you're in, he's saying the same thing. In other words, what the massive studies have shown in your day and mine is that linguistically, there is no difference between the tongues spoken by a witch doctor in Borneo and that of an American Pentecostal. Linguistically, there is no difference. Even though the person's language might be different, when they speak in tongues, it's the same tongue. That is incredible. As Christians, it's imperative that we recognize, I'm suggesting this morning, beloved, from God's Word, we recognize that Satan is at work here He's trying to mix a deadly error with God's biblical truth. His unclean spirits of revelation are masquerading in Christian robes as though they are angels of light. Did somebody warn us about that? They are capable of providing a spiritual experience. Hear me now, church. These spirits are capable of providing an experience, a spiritual experience that seems so precious to the Christian that they are tempted to place their experience above, thus saith the Lord. 
Let me say it in another way. And again, I say this as respectfully as I know how. Today we know that our modern glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, did not come from a study of the Bible, but rather after the experience had been experienced. The Bible was then used to give theological and scriptural support and to give it authenticity. The experience came first, and then we wrapped the Bible around it. Let me show you what I mean. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is the classic tongues chapter. And I only want to make one point here this morning. I want to share one point with you in verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. I'd like for you to take a look and see if you find a little word there that says unknown. Do any of you see it? If you do, it's because you're probably reading from the King James Version. The word unknown is unknown in most modern versions. It's not there. Because it's not in the original manuscripts, beloved. That's why it's in italics in your Bible. Look at it again. It's in italics. It's a supplied word. You find it again in verses 4, 13, 14, 19, and 27. My point is very simple. Paul was not dealing with the problem of unknown tongues in the church at Corinth. He was dealing with a problem of known tongues which were being abused. Now, what do I mean by that? First, we need to take a little look at understanding something very important. As we take a look at the entire New Testament... There is only three, there are only three understandings in the Greek language for the word tongue. Now just mark this down. It's classic, but it's extremely important. As we take a look at the whole New Testament, and take a look at every Greek rendering of the word tongue, there's only three understandings in the Greek of what tongue means. Only three. One meaning for the word tongue is the organ in one's mouth. This thing right here. That's what I mean. I talk about your tongue, talking about what's in your mouth. A second meaning for tongue is that of a musical instrument. Like the tongue in a reed instrument, for instance. The third meaning for tongue is that used to denote a language that is understood. In other words, when someone says, in what tongue do you speak? Oh, I speak German. I speak English. That's how the word tongue was understood. In the Greek, there is no such thing as an unknown tongue. It didn't exist. The true gift of tongues or languages had obviously been given then to a number of those within the church of Corinth. This gift had been given for the benefit. Now we're looking, please note, we're looking at the true tongue, the new tongue that Jesus said, my people will use as compared to what the witch doctors use which is, un under, which is not understandable. Are you with me? Now this is what Paul is seeing in the New Testament. He's seeing a fulfillment of God's power upon the church through a new tongue. And there's a problem in the Corinthian church and he's addressing the problem. It's not an unknown tongue, it's a known tongue and he's addressing the problem. Now let's take a look at it. The true gift of tongues here had obviously been given to a number of those within the church at Corinth. This gift had been given for the benefit of the body not the individuals themselves. Please note that God does not give gifts to people to st just to waller in the gift. God never gives a person a gift just so that they can be benefited by it. It would lift that person up. God always gives gifts to a person to give to the church. And just like in the book of Acts chapter 2, God gave the gift of tongues or languages so the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ could be given to those who had gathered in Jerusalem. So Corinth, take a look at it, had a population of about 600,000 people during the days of Paul when he wrote the letter to the church at Corinth. It was an important commercial center. It was a crossroads of culture. It was a place where various language groups intermingled every day freely. It was a place where the gift of tongues or known languages could prove to be a tremendous blessing to the pagans who needed to hear about Jesus the Christ. But the church people 
had become so excited about their gift, their true gift of speaking in a known tongue or language, that they insisted on using it, even if it was not understood by others in the congregation. And I dare say, beloved, that if you and I had the same gift poured out upon us today, we would become so excited about what happened to us that we would go around and show it off. Right? If I could speak, speak in Samoan, I would sing to you right now. I just, And not a one of you would be blessed by it because you wouldn't know a thing that I was saying. I could even say, I don't like you. And you'd say, Amen, after the whole thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? The people then were really no different than we are today. They were excited, ecstatic, if I could say that word, about the fact that they could speak in another language and maintain their original language. And so what happened? Paul had to pick up his pen and wrote counsel that was needed to give them guidance in the use of this precious gift. Never more than three at a time in front of the congregation. No more than three languages being given. And even then, one at a time. And only then, if you have an interpreter that can speak the language of the people. See what I'm saying? When you put the word unknown in it, suddenly you don't really know what's going on. And you get this mystic experience that there must have been some strange thing happening in the church of Corinth. Beloved, it was a known tongue. God doesn't pour out a confusing tongue upon his people. God pours out His true Spirit upon His people. Satan wants to pour out a false spirit upon those who claim to be God's people. Now once we understand that the true biblical gift of tongues is a gift of language for the sole purpose of spreading the gospel and not for the benefit of the person who receives the gift, then we can see the contrast between the purpose of God's Holy Spirit and the purpose of Satan's unclean spirit. While God is speaking, in other words, to lift up Jesus, his son, and draw the people of the world to him through an intelligent understanding of the scriptures, Satan, on the other hand, is working to unite Protestants, Catholics, and pagans together under a mysterious excitement that appeals to their their heart, not their mind or reason, and appears to be spirit-led. In spite of this obvious contrast, I hear people say, well, can something that unites people be all that bad? Again, I answer, absolutely yes. Unity for unity's sake means absolutely nothing. Unity must be united with truth. Unless we unite on truth, And on a thus saith the Lord, beloved, we will unite on a platform of error which is building on the sand. And Jesus said, don't do it. I want to build on the rock. How about you? Beloved, let me read one more little text for you as we close this morning. It's found in Acts chapter 5, verse 32. I want you to remember this text. If you don't remember anything else I've said today, remember this one. There are many voices crying out today, saying that they've been baptized in the Spirit. They claim to have been slain in the Spirit, or claim to speak with the tongues of angels and not men. They claim to praise God in the tongues of heaven. But I have God's Word this morning, as you do too, to tell us that this worldwide phenomenon is Satan's unclean spirits at work, seeking to unite the world preparatory for the final battle against God himself in the battle of Armageddon. What I'm saying, beloved, is that Satan today is marshalling his troops and through an unknown charismatic experience, not founded on truth, but an experience, Men and women of all faiths are beginning to come together, strangely coming together, laying truth, doctrine, and God's word aside. Feeling that this must be of God because it is uniting us together, not on truth, but through an experience that we all speak in the same unknown, mysterious language. Satan, I'm suggesting, beloved, has sent his unclean spirits hopping all over this world today to unite the world for a final attack against God himself and God's own people by profession 
are part of the attack. And I say to you this morning, stop it. Don't get involved in turning your heart against God. Listen to what he said, beloved. You can trust his word. Now notice the conditions. You have it before you for the true spiritual baptism of God's Holy Spirit. This is what the Bible says. Acts 5, verse 32. Do you have it there? Acts 5, verse 32. Let me read it to you. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. To whom does God say he gives his spirit? That's correct. To those who obey him. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Here, beloved, now, don't lose me here. For here is the Achilles heel. By rejecting the seventh day Sabbath, a day that Satan and his angels despise because it honors God as the true source of life and all creation, including you and me. Those who speak in today's unknown tongue and are uniting together with Catholicism and Protestantism and spiritualism are placing themselves on the side of disobedience by choosing to unite together on a common day of worship which one day will become law. And that day will be the day that Satan set aside on which we can worship him as the great Son God. Someday. Beloved, I want to worship God on the day that Jesus set aside as holy and sanctified it and honored it and said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if you even break one of these least commandments, you've broken them all. Beloved, there is no loophole out of what God says in his word. If you love him, the seventh day Sabbath must be your Sabbath too. If you want to have God's Holy Spirit in your life, then you must be obedient to God. You cannot run with the world and also run with God at the same time. You cannot love the world and love the Father at the same time. We must separate from the world and unite ourselves totally with Jesus Christ. One or the other. We'll either worship on Sunday and receive the false spirit and unite with those who are members of the cults and Satan worship. Or we will move to the side of true Christianity, receive God's Holy Spirit, and worship on His holy day. One or the other. We can't have it both ways. Just down below from where my wife and I live is a church that meets on Sabbath and Sunday. Just in case. As I looked at that again this morning, I thought, here's a group of people that aren't really sure which is the Lord's day. But just in case, we want to cover both bases. Beloved, it won't work. For Jesus said, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy... You know the rest of it. Beloved, there is one day set aside. You can't take two days and worship God. Because God said you need to be working one of those days. And you need to decide and I need to decide which God will I serve. Is Baal our God or is Jehovah our God? May it be Jehovah, beloved. May we stand on thus saith the Lord and not on an experience, not on emotion, not on feeling, not on sensation. Satan can give us that. Let's stand on God's word and eat alone. What do you say? Let us pray. Father, this morning we want your true spirit to fall on us, to fill us, that we might be spokespersons for you, speaking your truth in love and compassion and power, not with confusion, not with utterances that even we don't understand, but rather, Father, with a clarity that all those who are around us 
can hear and understand. Give us better speech, not confusing. Give us clearer articulation, not confusing. Give us, Father, truly the prayer of angels that we might worship God who alone is worthy in a language that's worthy to be heard and understood. Father, I pray that you'll bless each of us this day. Fill us with your spirit, please, that we might be your witnesses in all the world so that Jesus might soon come. In his name we pray. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. American Christian Ministries is not a one-man band. It is an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.